Yeah, welcome back to Think Tech. Um, and uh, we, we are now doing um, Japan and looking to the future of the USA. I'm looking to the east um, with Steve Zercher. He's in Kobe, Japan, and he's a teacher there at uh, Kansai Gadai University. But he also comes around to Hawaii and teaches at the Scheidler College. And mostly it's about uh, business and entrepreneurship and economics. And it's a perfect day to catch Steve on that subject. Welcome back to the show, Steve. Always my pleasure, Jay. Thank you very much. Yeah, you sound great. Okay, so uh, let's talk great. about it. We have a, a number of slides, and we want to compare the, the dynamics of the uh, Japan economy with the dynamics of the um, American economy and see how they work together these days and how one will affect the other. Okay, tell us about it. Right. Yeah, I, since I live here and uh, I'm teaching business and uh, entrepreneurship, as you noted, I keep up with economic trends here. <laughs> my my um, first visit to Japan was back in the 1970s. I'm giving away my age. So I've watched Japan develop uh, from you know, out of the ashes of World War II uh, to become the number two economy in the world. And then most recently to go through a long period of, of stagnation. So um, it's really, it's not covered all that well in the United States, but since I'm here, I follow it quite closely. And there's some striking economic trends that are occurring in Japan. But as I look back to the United States, some of these things that are occurring here in Japan are also occurring in the United States, but they're also not well understood, perhaps, or not well discussed. So that's the topic for the call today for our looking to the east. Well, I think so, we should all be interested because that, we should all be interested in this because there have there has been talk over the past few months in the Trump administration about about how we, we might have a global recession on the on the horizon. Um, it's not necessarily you know, yes. li limited to his actions, but maybe trends in the world, trends in Asia, trends in Europe, and sure. trends in the U.S. So this is very important for us to understand how the global economy is doing and how it will be doing and how the connection is going between Japan and the U.S. Right. Yeah, Japan is, is teetering on the edge of a recession right now, and most business people are, are forecasting they do a survey of the business leaders periodically, and they're beginning to indicate that Japan will be moving into a recession uh, maybe in the next quarter or two, or maybe even Q4, uh, there'll be negative growth. But before we get into that, just very briefly, Jay, I want to mention that uh, this week uh, there was a major meeting in Bangkok uh, of a regional trade organization. It's called RECEP, the Regional Comprehensive Economic partnership, and uh, this is the counterbalance that China created in response to the initiative that the Obama administration has focused on the TPP, or the Trans-Pacific Partnership. So Obama, as you remember, uh, did a pivot, you know, looking away from the Middle East toward the United States, you know, for, for decades. Mm -hmm. uh, we have focused our our energies and fun, unfortunately been involved in wars, some of which we started. So Obama said, no, Asia is really the future because that's where the economic growth is and began to strongly support the TPP. It was not a, originally a U.S. initiative, but it became one uh, because Obama endorsed it and the United States economy is number one in the world. So China, as a counterbalance, came up with their own economic in, uh, association because uh, in the TPP, China was explicitly excluded. So as you know, uh, Trump in his first few days withdrew from the TPP because he said that it was not in the United States' best interest. And that gave a huge boost to this Chinese trade consortium, which is now gaining momentum. Uh, and they just uh, finished uh, their major regional meeting in Bangkok. And the results of that um, were fairly positive overall. India is somewhat reluctant to join because they're afraid of the uh, influx of Chinese goods. But many com uh, countries now are committing to this regional partnership because there is kind of an absence of the U.S. on this broader multilateral trade front with the withdrawal from the TPP. In fact, 
the representatives of the United States in Bangkok were, I think, third-level people. Uh, for example, Prime Minister Abe went, and uh, President of Korea went, and the, foreign, uh, the Trade Minister for China went. They had all high-level people, but we didn't send anybody. So it's a clear signal from the United States that uh, this regional trade organization is not something that uh, is a high priority. And the second factor is the uh, tariffs that are going on between China and the United States, and um, you're very aware of that, Jay, I know. That's mm -hmm. what I think most of your viewers or listeners are. <clears throat> Excuse me. So the countries look at that and go, oh, my gosh, this could happen to us. So how do we protect ourselves? And that's uh, making a push for countries to be uh, more invested in this Chinese uh, trade association, trade collaboration. So if you can, if you can address that, two questions and, uh, that co come to mind, Steve, about uh, the, uh, what is it, um, RECEP uh, conference and the, the whole yeah. notion of a, you know, a competition to the uh, Pan, was it Pan Pacific Partnership, um, is this. Yeah. One is, um, so, so this strengthens ostensibly China's position vis-a-vis uh, -vis other countries, even countries that are distant. Yeah. So what's the connection between RECEP uh, and the One Belt, One, one Road initiative? Uh, is, China, is China trying to enhance its opportunities on One Belt, One Road with RECEP, uh, or are they different? Yes. Yeah, I, I think it would, you could consider it to be a part of their overall strategy, creating an a, a Asian-wide uh, trade association where tariffs are reduced for member countries would encourage trade among those countries, as you know, is the case with the EU and also with NAFTA. I mean, there's so many examples of regional trade organizations being effective in that regard. So that's in China's best interest. And to some extent now, it's in the interest of the member countries. I mean, I think it's in the upper 20s. There's a lot of countries that are involved in this. Mm -hmm. So yes, I think uh, with this forward momentum, with this gaining greater prominence, with the withdrawal of the well, United let me, States. Let me ask you my second question. You know, it, it, it occurs yes. to me that if uh, China and the other members of RECIP uh, have what they want, or have what China wants, um, that's going to be, um, you know, um, a, a valuable asset to their economies, um, as yes. a T, TPP was supposed to be a valuable asset to, you know, the economies of the members who were involved. But it, it strikes me that, right. and, and the U.S. Uh, by becoming isolationist is is writing its own uh, epitaph in the sense that uh, our economy cannot be as strong if we don't uh, collaborate with other countries. If we're not a global player, that's ultimately going to undermine our economy. And I, I think that's just a general matter of economics, as we know economics. Yeah. But but what's happening? Yeah, I, it seems I, I to I agree me, with that. It's What's happening, sorry, it seems ahead, to me, is that this isn't necessarily in itself going to bring a global recession or, or worse, um, it's, but it's going to, at the end of the day, these moves that Trump's isolationism uh, and China's, um, you know, China's efforts in One Belt, One Road and in Recep um, are going to be a rebalancing, a rebalancing of the world economy. And, and the countries uh, that are involved in RECEP will be stronger and the U.S. will be weaker. What do you think about the notion of rebalancing? Oh, yeah, I, I totally agree with that. And uh, it, In one of my classes, I show a slide of the historic contribution of Asia to worldwide GDP. And for the last 2,000 years, Asia, economically, through India and through China primarily, has dominated uh, it's only with the communist revolutions and so forth that the economic contribution of China and, and uh, India and others went down to where the U.S. and Europe dominated ec economically. So the growth, as Obama noticed, and all, all economists, and I tell my students in my classes all the time, the growth is here in Asia. Mm -hmm. And the United States, if it wants to ensure its future economic opportunity, needs to do a better job of connecting to this region in various ways. And multilateral agreements are much more preferable. I think economists recognize that and individual countries recognize that. I mean, if you are at Burma and you have to do 20 separate individual negotiations with all of these countries, that's just unbelievably burdensome. 
and maybe even bordering on impossible, but if you join a regional trade organization, it's just one agreement. It may be more complicated to actually negotiate that, but then you just do it once. Mm. Yeah, so, it sounds more efficient. Well, it, sounds, it sounds in general more course. efficient. And, 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 that's, and yeah, that's what counts exactly. in the economics. All of these that's right. All of these one-off types of free trade agreements, it's, it's called the, the economics, economists call it the noodle bowl. I mean, you, you have all these captured in time agreements with separate countries, and sometimes they begin to work against your own best interest. But as you point out, Jay, unfortunately, maybe because of his real estate background or whatever, uh, he, Trump feels that the best negotiations are one-on-one, -on -one mm -hmm. and that multilateral these regional organizations make the U.S. Mm -hmm. worse off, which is not true based on the data and what most mainstream mm -hmm. economics think. So, for example, Trump withdrew from the TPP, and now he's done a free trade agreement with Japan. He's kind of forced Japan to do that. We still don't know all the details, but as far as I've heard through my connections, what he's gained through that agreement, that one-on-one -on -one free trade agreement between the United States and Japan is exactly what he would have gained anyway if he just stayed in the TPP. Mm -hmm. Well, let's take, so let's, take, let's take a moment and, and get back to the principal topic of the economies of okay. uh, Japan and, and the U.S. and how they compare. I know you have a number of slides that will help us understand the comparison. Why don't we look at those slides yes, now? I, yes, let's go ahead and pull up slide one. I want to look at three areas. I want to look at um, demographics, which is obviously a big issue here in Japan, and then also look at debt, which mm -hmm. is a big issue here in Japan, and then also uh, deflation. So the first slide, this is a rather uh, stark look at the uh, dwindling population in Japan. And we talked about this, Jay, previously mm -hmm. on our calls, but here you can see the population peaked in the early 2000s at 127 million, it's about 125 now. And you can see how it's going down precipitously. So Japan is called a super Asian society. Uh, the number of people that are over 65, it's well over a quarter of the population now. I haven't, this particular slide projects Japan's population in 2105 at 44 million, which would be one third Right, approximately one third of what it is today. So that is what Japan is looking at. If, how's Japan responding to this? Well, uh, you know, the, the Abe administration recognizes that this is the problem, but it's a tough one to deal with. So what's behind this? If we go to slide two, it's a dwindling of the fertility rate. Obviously, when a couple gets married, in order to replace themselves, they need to have at least two children. Statistically, it actually has to be 2.1 because of infant deaths and so forth. But Japan's fertility rate, as you can see, is going down. It's actually below the sustainable number quite significantly in the 1.4 range. And that's been pretty consistent now for quite a while. So that's what's driving the population going down, is that couples are not getting married, or when they do get married, they're either not having children or they're having just one. Most of my, my uh, son's friends are uh, single children. Very rarely do you see a family with more than two kids, like for three or four. And four. Japanese family have five kids. That's like, like what's going on? That's really, really strange. So that's well, what's going on with the death rate? Well, wanted... You have a death rate there that is increasing. What What is that well, about? Yeah, Japan, Japan is aging. So the uh, more and more people are dying, right? Because they're getting into their 80s and 90s. Wow. Japan is one of the most healthy societies in the world. You know, I go to a sports club and the average age is probably 70. So these people are amazing in terms of staying fit. There was a statistic just a couple of weeks ago that 70 year old people in Japan are stronger in 2019 than they were in 2018. <laughs> so they're very healthy. I know, isn't that amazing? It's, uh, but I believe it because I see these people working out uh, almost every day at my sports club, more often than I do for sure. <laughs> But Japan is getting older, so as people go into their 80s and 90s, obviously they begin to die off, and there's more people dying now than are being born. Okay, so let's let's go situation. on through the slides now because we're going to run out yeah, of time. Yeah, so, so 
Yeah, um, yeah, we took a little, uh, the reset took a little bit too much time. But anyway, um, so let's look at the U.S., right? So the U.S. is actually experiencing the same thing, not quite so dramatically. So the birth rates right now are below the death rate in Japan. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, in the United States. So the statistic for couples' children is 1.4 or so in the in Japan. It's actually 1.8 in the United States. So the United States right now, the population, if it wasn't for immigration, would actually be shrinking as well. And I don't think most Americans recognize that or understand that. These statistics for aging in Japan are beginning to show up. Like, for example, I read recently in Maine that they also have a quarter of their population over the age of 65. So in some states, maybe more rural states, this aging phenomenon is occurring. Mm -hmm. Right. So the next slide is uh, the, the kind of the aha slide. So as I mentioned, the United States population is actually holding steady or it's going up incrementally, and that is because of immigration. So this, this next slide, the U.S. population with and without immigration, this is just shocking. Look at this, Jay. If it wasn't for immigration, our population would be one-third of what it is right now. Mm -hmm. This country was formed on immigration, and it continues to be sustained on immigration, and that's true as of today. Now, I, you know, this, this addresses the issue of have become so politicized in America under the Trump administration with uh, immigrants and the economic value that they provide and so forth. But clearly, the United States, as of today, as of 2019, without immigration, would begin to shrink like Japan is. So that's a commonality. Well, so the unspoken thing here, the unspoken thing is that um, you, you need to have growth in population to have a growth in the, in the economy. Am I right about that? Yeah, that, I think economists, that's kind of mainstream thinking. If you don't have demographic uh, growth, then how do you grow your GDP? And I think Japan is experiencing that because Japan's growth in terms of population is now shrinking, and the GDP has been pretty much flat. So those two things are very strongly related. It may not be one-to-one, -one, um, so I don't think it's one-to-one, -one, but it's certainly a major contributor to the fact that Japan has not been growing economically. And if that trend takes hold in the United States and the you know, United States population begins to stabilize or, or even, like, let's say Trump wins again and cuts off immigration entirely, so the, uh, the United States population begins to go down, the United States will face the same problem that Japan has been facing for the last 10 years. Mm -hmm. Let's move on to debt. <clears throat> so the next slide is uh, Japanese debt, which is, is famous, right? So Japan's percent of public debt as a as looking at it from uh, the comparison to the GDP is at Greek levels or even higher, right? <clears throat> so Japan's debt is massive. Its public debt is massive. And under Abe, it's growing significantly. Uh, Jim Rogers, the famous investor, the, the investor biker, I don't know if you know him, Jay, but he was in Japan just recently, and he's forecasting serious uh, ramifications for Japan because of this massive debt that uh, Japan has been growing and continues to grow. So that's fairly well known, uh, well understood, and he's written, uh, Jim Rogers has written uh, books about that. <laughs> but let's look at the United States. <clears throat> it also has a debt problem, right? The U.S. debt, if you look at the next slide, you know, slide number six, you can see total debt versus percentage of GDP. Now, it's not quite as dramatic as the United States. It's not at a 200% level, but it's edging into 100% level. And if we take a look at this in, uh, rather than in current dollars, we take a look at it in terms of 2014 dollars, percentage of debt actually does increase the Jap uh, does increase to the Japanese level almost at 180 percent. That's the red line going up there on 180 percent. And uh, as you know, uh, if you're following the current debt for 2019, the uh, budget office for the United States government is forecasting a $1 trillion debt 
2019, and that's driven primarily by the tax law that uh, Trump and the Republicans passed about a couple of years ago now, mm -hmm. I guess it is, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, in reducing taxes. So the U.S. debt is going to be increasing by a trillion dollars a year uh, over the next few years. So again, Japan has this debt problem, and it's trying to address it. It just recently raised the sales tax here from 8% to, to uh, 10% as a way to counterbalance that. I don't know if that's going to work or not. But that may be actually another trigger to push Japan into recession. Mm -hmm. But the U.S. at some point will have to take a look at this massive government debt that's uh, being accrued because uh, it will also put the U.S. economy at risk in the same way Jim Rogers is saying the Japan economy potentially is at risk. So that's debt. And uh, do you have any questions there, Jay? I'm moving pretty yeah, quickly. Yeah, well, no, um, certainly. I, I, what are the factors, what are the processes by which Japan's economy affects the U.S. and the U.S. economy affects Japan. I mean, we are we have been since the war tied, you know, to, at the hip. Um, but what what yeah. are the processes that 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 happen? I mean, if, if Japan's economy goes down, how is that going to make ours go down, and vice versa? Well, yeah, if Japan goes into a recession, consumer. Uh, economic activity, which is a majority of economic activity, it's uh, around 80% or so of economic activity is driven by the domestic demand. So if that begins to tail off, if the Japanese consumers begin to get more conservative, and it, it's kind of leading towards that right now, and the consumption of American goods uh, potentially could go down. So. That would have a negative impact on U.S. economic activity, and that America, the Japanese people would be buying fewer uh, American goods potentially. Now, the free trade agreement that was signed between Trump and uh, or, and Abe uh, hopefully will counterbalance that somewhat. But it's, it's hard, you know, if, if the Japanese economy goes into recession, then the amount of consumption will go down, and that would include American products as well. So there's one link that way. Well, the, uh, will this um, uh, RCEP trade agreement uh, save Japan from negative effects that it might otherwise have from the U.S.? Yeah, that's a very interesting question. So Japan, uh, of course, is very strongly aligned with the United States politically. I mean, they're, they're really like in step. There's very little that Japan does that's outside of what America is doing, you know, in terms of foreign policy and economic uh, strategy and so forth. But uh, Japan's number one trading partner is not the United States, China, and it has been now for almost a decade. Mm. And Japan also recognizes that Asia is the growth opportunity. It's not Europe, and it's probably not the United States. So the, the Abe and the Japanese leaders are kind of caught between their political alliances and historic relationship with the United States coming out of uh, World War II. And the reality is that Asia is the growth opportunity. So Japan is a member of RCEP and will continue to be and will be uh, a, a contributing member for that. It has to do that because it cannot exclude itself from this regional trade agreement. But it does put them at odds somewhat politically to the United States. And the United States is not going to say, "Don't Japan, don't be a member. That would be like too blunt. They, they can't do that. Yeah. But it does put Japan in somewhat of a bind. Yeah. Well, you know, it strikes me that uh, if you know Trump could uh, get elected again, he could avoid the impeachment and get elected and uh, continue the exactly the same policies to see it as a mandate, isolationism, and all that. And that, from what you describe, right. it sounds like that will that will turn Japan further west. That will turn Japan into the uh, R RCEP. Um, that will make Japan more dependent on China, more engaged with China and, and the rest of Asia. Um, and, and I suppose the question is, if, assuming that happens, um, you know, and, and taking due regard of the fact that Japan may be in for a recession here, uh, can we avoid a, a world recession? Uh, in other words, can Asia keep the world out of recession? Uh, or are we bound for a recession, uh, if not you know, by other factors than by the factor that the U.S. is still the biggest economy and the U.S. is heading for a disaster if, uh, 
if Trump keeps, uh, you know, continuing his, his isolation and trade war policies? Right. Wow, that, that's a huge question, Jay. It, it goes beyond my slide, that's for sure. Uh, well, China is the number two economy, and the most uh, economists feel that eventually China will be nominally the number one economy in the world. China has its economic challenges, but its growth rate is still at 5%, which is easily double for the United States. Mm. India's growth rate also, even though they have some economic challenges as well, is, uh, last time I checked, it's in the 7 to 8% range. So despite the challenges, the infrastructure issues, and so forth, uh, the two strongest growing economies in the world, or two of the strongest ones, major ones, are, are here in Asia. Mm. So that might be a counterbalance to the worldwide recession. I think if we look back to the Lehman crisis, as it's called here in Japan, you know, 2008, 2009, and uh, the world economy was, was shocked and went into recession. But China was stable through that period of time. So it did, at that particular point in time, act as a counterbalance to yeah. the downward trends that the rest of the world were going through. Yeah. Um, but this, this is a, I don't know, there's many complicated factors here. It depends on the political negotiations that occur between China China's causing conflict here in Asia or on, on a territorial basis, claiming regions of the South Pacific as their own and fighting with the Philippines and Thailand and Vietnam and others. So there are, beneath the broader trends, some regional conflict issues that could upset things. But I think to answer your question at a high level, Asia could help to offset uh, a European or a U.S.-based recession, and even if Japan is thrown into that too. Mm. Uh, because the economic growth does continue, is continuing in the uh, in China and Southeast Asian region. Well, as you know, this all goes to uh, exactly what you know what trouble we can get into by being isolationist. And it seems to me, from what you said, that China yeah. China is not ignoring this issue. China understands everything you and I have talked about. China understands the oh, need absolutely. for planning. It's a long term planning orientation in China. <clears throat> and for that matter, in Japan, and for that matter, all the countries of the uh, recent um, trade organization. So it seems to me they would right. probably be trying to make themselves more sustainable, more resilient in the face of, uh, you know, a failure by the U.S. Uh, and hopefully, at least for them, they can keep away from our failure by working together. And I think, I think actually, Steve, that that sort of that is, it sounds like the future, where the, the rebalance, if you will, the repivot is, is happening in, in Asia. And when you look again, when right. everything turns up again and everything is, you know, coming up roses, uh, Asia will be, you know, the number one group of economies in the world. And Europe and, and, right. uh, and the U.S. will be the number two group of economies in the world. So we are actually watching a huge rebalance right now, in the making, don't you think? Absolutely. Yeah, it's been going on now for the last 10 to 15 to 20 years. And it will continue into the future, and China understands it, and they play the long game. I mean, they historically have been the most dominant country economically in the world, if you look back over the last 2,000 years. It's an anomaly that they're not right now. Mm. They will move to that position, and they're looking beyond Trump's, you know, they're, and they're figuring out how to best achieve their dominance. And your children, my children, will be living in that world. It'll be obvious to them, even though it's not quite so obvious to uh, Americans right now, and even somewhat to Japanese, to try and reconcile uh, Japanese economic interests with their historic political interests. Yeah, well, but it will, so, uh, it very will briefly, happen. Jay, I know we're running out of time. The last thing I want to do, maybe we can just skip to slide 10. I wanted also to take a look at deflation, which is a chronic problem here in Japan. Uh, consumers are buying less and less, and as a result, prices are actually negative and have been negative for quite a while. But this, the last slide, number 10, also indicates that the United States is similar that it doesn't have a high inflation rate, that it actually has mirrored Japan somewhat. You see the red and the green line there, uh, the consumer price index numbers, that Japan 
is attempting to try and fix this unsuccessfully in the last five or six years. And, and the United States also shares this. So from a demographic perspective, um, from a, a deflation perspective, and from a debt perspective, the U.S. and Japan actually does share these common problems. The US, the, Japan's been experiencing it longer, and it's been trying to solve these things. The United States, these things are happening, but at least I don't read, and maybe Jay, you can correct me, that our leaders are beginning to address this. Like, for example, is the U.S. looking at demographics? Is it, is it recognizing that it's, a, it's an aging society? I, I don't think so. No, I don't think so either. Let but me ask is. you this last question, yeah. Steve. So if we have deflation, yeah. if we have deflation, and, and, and who knows, maybe the rebalance toward Asia will affect that last chart. But assuming that, assuming yeah. just we look at the four corners of that chart and we have a, a sort of a joint deflation between the U.S. and Japan, how does that affect the economy? What, mm -hmm. what does the deflation mean in terms of uh, the health and prosperity of an economy? Well, economics is, is uh, assumes growth. Right? So this is how we think of economic success. And when you have deflation, you lose growth. Right? So the consumer spends less. This has been the problem that Japan has been facing for now, for two decades. Consumers decide not to spend money because logically they recognize, well, I want to buy a car, and you know, I'm in November right now, but if I wait until uh, Summer 2020, the price will be less ah, I because see. of deflation. And right. So there, you start this trap where consumers delay consumption, and it makes the economy struggle. Yes, so that I is see. the trap. That's the problem Japan has been experiencing now for a long time. Abe has tried to end his way out of it um, by lowering the discount rate. It's actually negative here in Japan by encouraging the Bank of Japan to buy equities. 40% of all Japanese stocks are now owned by the Japanese government. It is unbelievable. Mm -hmm. But he did that in order to try and, you know, jumpstart the economy and have companies have this flush of cash and therefore spend it uh, on salaries, which they have not done. Uh, things are changing, so aren't that they? that is the issue. Things are changing, maybe Pardon? not so much for the good. And we have to follow it. I, I would like to talk to you about this on a regular basis, actually. I mean, this one subject. Okay, very so good. So sort of take the take the temperature. And, of course, you're coming in January. We can enjoy a show together here in the studio, and that'll be great. So, Steve Zercher. Well, I'm, I'm very, much look, yes, very much looking forward to that, Jay, and also the martini that you promised me uh, in the last show. Yeah, I promised you that in public. So that'll be uh, – I'll make good on that promise, Steve. You'll see. And everyone will know. Oh, very good. Steve Zercher, looking to the east. Thank you so much. We'll, we'll see you again in two weeks. Thank you so much, Dave. It's my pleasure. Aloha. Sayonara. Bye-bye. Thank you. <laughs>